This continues our discussion uh, on fatigue uh, analysis that we started yesterday. So we're still setting the groundwork for the theory here, and I need to talk about these two topics before we get into an example of how to apply all this stuff to a real problem. So topics are not sensitivity and stress concentration factor. Now, you've already met stress concentration factor. We talked about that back in Chapter 5 for the static case. And I showed you how when you have you know, funny changes in section, sharp corners, notches, all that stuff, that the stresses can go quite high, in fact, to infinity, theoretically, in some cases. It turns out that if you're statically loaded, like Chapter 5, and you have ductile materials, quite often you don't worry about the stress concentration factor, if it's not too high, because the premise is that the material being ductile will yield locally around that stress concentration and actually relieve itself to some degree. But when I have time-varying loads, all bets are off in that regard. The stress concentrations have become a really serious issue, so we have to take them into account. So we're going to use those stress concentration factors, the case of T's that we talked about back in ch uh, Chapter 5, and we're going to convert them into something called a fatigue stress concentration factor, which we will call K sub F. So that's what this is about. Now, the not sensitivity business is a material property. And it turns out that some materials are more sensitive than others to the presence of a notch, i.e., a stress concentration. Notch, by the way, is used universally in this business to represent any disruption in contour a little groove, a little fillet, a, whatever, it's called a notch, okay? It doesn't have to literally be a notch to be called a notch. So what you see here is a plot of a bunch of curves, and on the x-axis is the radius of the notch, starting at zero, which would be a sharp crack, and going to about two-tenths of an inch, which is not quite a quarter of an inch. So all pretty small numbers. And on the vertical axis, is a factor called Q, and that's referred to as the notch sensitivity of the material. Over on the right upper portion of the plot, we see a fan with values for strengths of the materials, and this, by the way, is for steel. There's companion charts on the next page for aluminum, which I'm not going to bother to show here. They look very similar. The numbers are all different. So those are ultimate tensile strengths of steel shown both in uh, KPSI and also megapascals, okay? And 200,000 pounds per square inch is a very strong steel. Not the strongest, they go up close to 300. But this chart only goes to 200. And 50 is your plain vanilla I-beam steel. Very cheap 1020 low carbon steel. So that's pretty much spans the range of strengths of typical steels. And note that the sensitivity, which is going to be used, this Q is going to be used to reduce the effect of K sub T. So if I have a K sub T of 3 and a notch sensitivity of Q, it's going to knock that 3 down to maybe two or one and a half or something in that neck of the woods. That's a good thing. And there's a very serendipitous thing going on here. I don't think there's any explanation scientifically for it, but it's, it's true. I can see it. And that is, as the notch radius gets smaller, going f f closer and closer to a crack, the sensitivity of the material goes down. Counterintuitive. If it weren't for this, we could never design anything that didn't break with a notch. If it went up, God help us, right? If it got more sensitive, the sharper the notch got. This is having a counter effect to the effect of the notch. But it varies with the material. And notice that the ones that plunge deepest over here, to all the way to 2 tenths, so really make a big reduction in the effect of stress concentration, are the, are the low strength steels. And as I go up in strength, which of course, involves a trade-off of ductility, doesn't it, in steel? You make it stronger, you're going to lose some of the ductility. So you can think of it in, that, in those terms as well. 
as I go up in strength, I go down in ductility, and my knot sensitivity increases. But luckily, when I get down here to very sharp cracks in which the stress goes to infinity, potentially at a zero radius, then those numbers are even coming down to around 0.6. So this saves our bacon. So we're going to use this material property called knot sensitivity to modify the, the geometric stress concentration, the case of T, which we get out of Peterson's book and other sources that says, I have a shaft with a fillet of a certain radius and different diameters, and I got a moment load on it or whatever, and here's a chart of these curves that give me K sub T factors, depending on how sharp the radius is and all that stuff. And those tend to run anywhere from like 1.1 is about the best to maybe 3 or 4 or 5, which is going to increase the stress by that amount at that location. This is now going to pull it back down a little bit. So here's some of the terminology, and this is an example we'll do in a few minutes. It's example 6.4 or something in the book. So we're now going to use a different nomenclature for stress con concentration in fatigue, and the F stands for fatigue, as you, you could imagine. So K sub F is going to be determined by starting with the K sub T, which is the number from the back of the book from Peterson's data going back to the 50s and also modern data done with finite elements. And we're going to have a different situation when we're loaded in shear. So we'll, we'll have a different number, and we'll call it K sub F S for shear. And here's the relationship between K sub T. That's what I, I would call a Peterson stress concentration factor due to geometry, the sharpness of the notch, the particular loading, the particular shape. You know, Is it round? Is it square? Is it this? Is it that? So this I look up in a table. and I take this Q parameter, which is this so-called notch sensitivity, and I modify the KT by it, and I get a KF. So notice that if Q was 0, KF would be 1. If Q was 0, it would take away all the K sub T. In effect, it takes the notch away. right? And we can see from that chart I had up a moment ago, Q can be as low as like 0.2. So I can get like 2 tenths of the K sub T if I have a material that is very insensitive to notches at that particular radius. Back to that chart for a second. You're more often going to be up in this neck of the woods up here. So you might be, for a low carbon steel, 7 tenths. That's still pretty substantial, 30% reduction. High, st high strength steel, maybe only a 5% reduction. Is a what? It's a ratio. It's unitless. Yeah, yeah. It's just a number. It's a it's a measure of the sensitivity of that particular material at that notch radius to the presence of a stress concentration. It's one way to put it. So. If you're, if you're in this neck of the woods, which is most often where you are, I mean, I don't want to have radii of my notches that are like 40,000. That's a millimeter. That's a pretty sharp corner, right? I'm going to be looking to have a couple of millimeters, so 08, or uh, three millimeters be 16 up in this neck of the woods here. So I'm going to be, I'm, I'm very rarely going to be down here. I don't want a notch that sharp, even though those curves look lovely there, but, you know. More realistically, I'm going to be up in here. So I'm out in the body of those. They're fairly flat. So I'm looking at n reduction numbers of the order of, take this one right here at, at 10 thousandths, uh, rather 100 thousandths, tenth of an inch, 0.7 to 0.9-ish. I'm going to pull down the effect of the stress concentration by 0.7. So I take one away from the K sub T, I multiply by the bugger factor, and I add the one back in. That's, what, that's all that's happening there, right? So I tone this down a bit based on the material's resistance or lack of resistance to notches. Yeah, that's correct. The K sub T by itself is considered to be used for a static case. 
questions. And if I had a brittle material, I definitely want to use that case of tea because the brittle material has no give. It's no, no ductile. It's got yield. It's going to break. So for brittle materials, I always apply the case of tea statically. Okay. And we try not to use brittle materials in fatigue because <laughs> if you do, they're going to break. <laughs> so we're usually ruling out brittle materials in fatigue loading situations, if at all possible. Okay. So you remember the sigma nominal is whatever you get for the case, F over A, MC over I, TR over J, whatever comes out of the particular loading situation you might have. Okay. And if I have a shear stress, pure shear stress, then I will go get the case of T for the shear case, which is a different number for shear loading, right? different chart in the back of the book, and apply this same uh, expression, just something S for that case of F there. So I'm going to calculate my case of F from this. And I'm always going to apply the case of F in a fatigue loading situation, because the stress concentrations are really important. Okay? I never ignore it. So again, this is my so-called theoretical static factor due to geometry, not sensitivity. Now, how, did, how were those curves in that picture generated? I generated those curves and made the picture. Well, there's a handy dandy equation to generate the curves. And that equation uses something called Nuber's constant. Mr. Nuber came up with this whole deal some long time ago. So I can calculate the Q by these, uh, this simple expression. It's the uh, 1 over the 1 plus the square root of A, which is Nuber's constant, divided by the square root of R, which is the radius of my notch. Okay. And remember, the bottom axis of that was the, was the r, radius of notch. And so where do we get these square root of a things? Well, Nuba's constant, he, he calculates, depending on the value of the ultimate tensile strength of the material, that was the other parameter in the family of curves, right? As the strength went up, I got a different curve. Uh, and I have reproduced his numbers in tables 6, 7, 6, 6, 7, and 8. And I show you those here. So these are right out of Nuba's work. So for a steel of whatever strength, and there's other tables for aluminum. There's aluminum, and there's hardened aluminum, anneal aluminum. Okay, So these data exist. So I don't have to ever uh, draw the curves or even look at the picture if I have this chart of numbers, because I can apply the formula. right? So if I have 100,000 PSI steel, uh, my Nuber's constant, which is the square root of A, and the square root goes along for the ride. I'm not going to take the square root of this number. It's already square rooted. Okay. Now I'm going to pull that number out and put it in that little formula we just saw there and divide it by the square root of R and get my Q. Then I'm going to take the Q and stick it in here and multiply by K sub T minus 1, add back the 1, and I got my K sub F. Okay, got it? And I'm going to do that every time I calculate a stress if it's fatigue loaded and the stress concentration. Oh, well, the ideal case is I have no stress concentration in my system, which could be possible. Oh, he just did it as the square root of A. And he's long gone. I can't ask him. <laughs> he, he presents the data as the square root of A. Fine, I'll take it. <laughs> take it any way I can get it. Yeah. So the higher the 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 more sensitive the material is to notches. Oh, the, higher the, Q. The, the higher the Q would be, right. Soft, gooey metals are very are less sensitive to these concentrations because they give readily at, at the crack. And the crack can actually physically become bigger. You know, if it gets stretched, the shape can change, and it, it does sort of a self-relieving. But if the material is resistant to yielding, which it is when you make it stronger, because you take some of the ductility away, then it doesn't have the ability to, to sort of recover from this insult as well. OK, that makes sense? So bottom line is, in fatigue, we don't always want to use the strongest possible seal we can buy. Because there are some negatives associated with that, the loss of ductility. 
Sometimes you're better off with a less expensive, more ductile steel in a fatigue-loaded case. Okay, new topic, very important topic, residual stress. So let's start off by defining it. It says just what the name says. It's built into the, the part or the assembly or whatever. And it could be there from the manufacturing process, quite often it is. It could be there from something I did at assembly, maybe on purpose, maybe not. Or it could be there because I did something deliberately to put it there to make things better. And that's where its real value comes in. Because I can use it to protect against fatigue failure if I do it right. If I do it wrong, I'm going to make myself more subject to fatigue failure. In a nutshell, what we're, what we're doing here is this. Fatigue failures are tensile in nature. That's well proven. Tensile stress is the culprit. Compressive stress does not fatigue fail things because it closes the cracks. Okay? So if I can build in compressive stresses, it's like a safety valve. If I, if I could force compressive stress into this part and have it stay there and sit there, and then I start to put tensile stress on it, I have to bring the tensile stress up from the cellar <laughs> down here in the compressive regime before it pops out and starts to really be tensile, because I got this compressive subtracting from it. So in essence, I'm pushing down the threshold by building in compressive stress. So that's why I say compressive stress is the fatigue designer's friend. And so there are several techniques that I've now described by which we can deliberately introduce compressive stress into our part. And there are other things that we can and sometimes really want and need to do that introduce compressive residual stresses. Uh, I'm sorry, residual tensile stresses is what I meant to say. And that's a bad deal, because now I'm jacking up the threshold, and I'm putting in some before I ever start to put load on the part. And that's a bad thing. So I already said that. I already said that, and I said that, right? Agree? We're going to try to bury it down in the cellar so it has a harder time seeing the light of day. So how do we do this? Well, there's three general approaches, and they're listed right there, thermal surface and pre-stressing. And I'll describe each of them in some detail. We know that in bending and torsion, which are our most common loadings in machinery, by the way, shafts get twisted, side loads bend them, and that's true of all sorts of parts. Um, we also will have direct shear, but it's, it's not as common as bending and torsion. And we often have them together. So I want more strength in my steel. And I know that from my materials course, that if I heat treat it, I can get the strength up quite a lot, right? If it has enough carbon in it, and I cook it the right way, and chuck it in a bu bucket of water when it's real hot, and quench it, and then put it in the oven, let it cook for a while to temper it to get a little ductility back and whatnot, right? That I can jack up the ultimate tensile stress by a factor of two easily. And I'm giving up ductility and other things like that. I'm also getting hardness, which is good for wear resistance and so forth and so on. So there's lots of times when I want, I need hardness. Cams and followers, almost always taken to full hard, Rockwell uh, 56C or thereabouts. Because they'll wear out if you don't. You've got the metal running on the metal, right? So we often want hardness, and that requires us to heat treat. Well, there's two ways I can heat treat in general. There's a lot of subcategories, but I can divide it into two things. Through hardening, stick the piece in an oven. Get it up to 2,000 F of that neck of the woods, red hot. Throw it in the bucket of water or oil. Quench it quickly. Lock the, the microstructure in the way it was at that high temperature, right? And now let it relax a little bit in the tempering oven and take away some of the brittleness and so forth. And I, if I do it right, I should have the same hardness through the part. If I cut the part in half and polish the face and turn it over and do a micro hardness test across, I should see the same hardness all the way across, right? That's a great way to get a good, strong part. But unfortunately, it builds in residual tensile stresses. So that's one trade-off of through hardening. But there's another way I can harden it, which actually puts in compressive residual stresses. And that's called case hardening. 
You remember that from ES 2001? They talked about that in that course? Sometimes called nitriding, carburizing. Carburizing is another term for it. Nitriding. Th those are different ways of doing case hardening. Case hardening is the generic term. It says, I'm going I'm to make an M&M &M &M out of it. I'm going to have a hard shell on the outside and a soft center. I'm just going to harden a shell on the outside of the part, which is maybe a millimeter or two or three deep. I can control that with the process to some degree. And there's a, there's a bunch of advantages to doing this. Number one, if it's a huge part and it has a lot of intricate shape to it, when I cook that thing in the oven to full red heat all the way through, it's going to warp like, like a pretzel because it's already got residual stresses and they're going to get relieved by the high temperature and I'm going to distort the part. Okay? So if I have a very big part, I probably would only rather heat the surface and then quench it so I get a hard shell. So large parts, case hardening works better. Also, if I case harden, I have a soft core. So the core is still ductile. So if cracks start to form, they're going to have a harder time surviving in the ductile steel than they would in the, in the brittle steel. Okay? So I'm not changing my whole cross section to brittle, which is more sensitive to fatigue cracks and so forth. So case hardening has a lot of attraction. In this context, it's, I get a bonus because when I case harden, it leaves compressive stress in the surface. Why is that? I heat the, the outside surface up down a millimeter or two, red hot, all right? And it expands. The core is cool. So when it expands, the core is pulling back on it with tensile stress. So I'm developing tensile stress in the core, and now, I dump it in the water, and I lock that in place. And I have now compressive stress locked into the shell, into the M&M &M shell, and tensile stress in the core to balance it, because the parts in equilibrium didn't fall apart, didn't crack in two. So I have to have equilibrium across the cross section, right? So I have locked in tensile stresses in the core, but the core's ductile. And if it's in bending or torsion, the stresses are out of the outer skin anyway. So I've protected where the stresses are high with some compressive stress to lower that threshold. Yes? Yeah, if I have shear stresses, then this ain't going to work so well, because they're going to be right across the, the midplane if it's a beam and bending. You're right. But uh, luckily, most of the cases that we deal with in machinery don't tend to have large uh, transverse shear stresses. If you have very short beams, you can get some, some transverse stresses. So you do have to check that. But th they're usually low compared to the bending stresses. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. The numbers are usually small compared to the bending numbers. So usually the, the, the things that are, are bugging us are the bending stresses and the torsional stresses in these kinds of parts. OK, so everyone clear on what's happening with the case hardening business? How we can leave some compressive stress in the surface. Second uh, process is surface treatment, and that breaks down into several different subparts. Cold working. What does that mean? Hammering, rolling. You can buy either hot roll steel or cold roll steel at the store. The hot roll steel is made just as it says. It's hot and run through rollers. It's red hot. And it's allowed to cool in air. And it develops scale, because it's rusting like the Dickens at high, high temperatures. You get rust all over it. It's got a rough surface from the rusting. You can then take that rough surfaced part and run it again through rollers that are at room temperature and squeeze it down to a smaller cross section. In the process, the rollers burnish the surface, get rid of the scale, and you get a nice smooth finish. But in the process, you've locked in stresses. Luckily, they can be compressive. So I can have compressive stresses in the surface that will protect me against bending and torsion type stresses. Right. So I can accomplish the coal working by hammering. Drawing is pulling it through dies. Rolling is sending it through rollers. The, the second one listed, the second big bullet there is called shot peening. 
This is also design engineer's friend. What it amounts to is the following. I take either a very heavy duty air gun, like I got loads of air behind me, and a bucket of buckshot. <laughs> and I stand back and I blow the buckshot at this part all over it until I make it full of dents. Literally dent the surface. And when I dent the surface, I build in compressive stress in the surface. Only affecting the surface and the inside is, is pulling back on it. So I stretch it. It's analogous to the heating that happens in case hardening, but I'm stretching it cold. And the inside pulls back on it and puts it in compression. So I can get an improvement in uh, fatigue resistance by peppering the thing with shot. And the shot that's used comes in all flavors. It can be steel, cast iron, uh, even walnut shells I use, believe it or not, on soft materials. The shot being, you wouldn't think that walnut shells would have enough mass or hardness, but they do work. They're used for soft metals. And pre-stressing is a trick that's a little bit subtle. I think I have a slide that shows that. Why don't I wait for that slide to come up? It'll be easy to explain. Here is the, uh, it, it'll be two slides downstream here. This is a plot of residual stresses due to case hardening. And there are two cases shown here. Nitrided is just one way of doing a case hardening. And this is the outside surface. And this is going into the material vertically. See, this is zero dimension, 0.025 inches in, and 0.05, a little more than a millimeter deep. So you only get about a millimeter, a millimeter and a half, maybe two, out of this thing. Carburized, as you may recall from your materials course, is you cook the material in a carbon-rich atmosphere. This is used for low to medium carbon steels, where you don't have enough carbon in the steel already to just cook it and quench it. That starts at about 1050, 50 points of carbon and up. There's enough in there to just heat treat it. If I'm below 40, 50 points of carbon, I've got to throw some more carbon into it. So you cook it in a furnace that has a carbon atmosphere, or ca carbon in the form of a gas. And I don't remember the details, so don't, don't press me on that. But that's a long time since I had a materials course. <laughs> but I, I can actually introduce more carbon into the surface this way. Nitriding is I use nitrogen, and that has a similar effect. But it shows me that I have here compressive residual stresses down to um, a depth of, well, half a millimeter there and a little over a millimeter there. This is a cross section of, a, of probably a round shaft of some sort. And we have a surface here and a surface there, and it's been heat treated to, to harden the case. And so this side, of, to the right of this line, is compression. To the left of this line is tension and the zero stress there. So we have put compressive stress into the outside and tensile in the middle to counteract it so that the net area of these is zero. And now this is an interesting little note here. Stress added by grinding. I didn't list that in my bad things that create residual tensile stress, but when I grind the surface of a part, I leave behind tensile stresses. And a lot of the time, I have to grind the part. I've got to get the finish. I've got to get the dimension. So if I case harden and then I grind, then I take away a little bit of what I added with the grinding. And I end up net ahead. Shot peening. This shows what happens to compressive stress. And these are in thousands of PSI, so there's quite a lot of, a lot of stress there. And again, down about a millimeter in depth. This is the outside world here, and you're going into the part up. 20 thousandths of an inch is just a half a millimeter. So surface peened of a certain material, nitrided, uh, honed, surface peened with Rockwell C64. It's difficult to measure and compute how much effect I've had by shot peening. But the, there is a technique by which you can get an indication of uh, a number. And to do that, they use what's called an Alman strip. Mr. Alman was the guy that came up with this whole idea a long time ago. So his name is attached to it, A-L-M-E-N. 
So th there's something called an Alman scale and an Alman strip. And the Alman strip is just a little piece of steel that's probably a half inch wide and maybe, uh, I don't know, an eighth inch thick or something like that by two inches long or something like that. And you put that with your part that you're, that you're blasting with shot. And you, it's, it's bolted down or clamped down so it can't move while it gets banged. And you, you shot paint only the surface of one side because the other's protected. Unclamp it, it curls up like this because you have compressive stress in the surface. So it self deflects. You measure the deflection and go to Mr. Allman's charts and the amount of deflection will tell you how much PSI of stress you've got in there. And that should be the same in your part if you went over both things at the same amount of time with the shot. Right? So you can get a little bit of a handle on what the numbers are. This pre-stressing is subtle and it's a little bit hard to understand when you first encounter it. And I encourage you to read the description in the book that I have because I'm not going to go through it in as much detail as probably is needed here. But the rule is that if I take a part that is going to be stressed in service only in one direction. It doesn't work if I have to reverse stress it. But truck springs are a good example because typically the load's always down on the ends of the spring, right? Up at the axle. And so the, the spring lives its life out doing this. If the spring ever does this, you probably have a, a, a dead truck. Right? <laughs> you probably aren't going to drive any further. So the spring is designed so it, it does this all the time. Sometimes a heavy loaded truck will be out horizontal but they shouldn't get it down that low. They've got too much weight in the truck. So with that example, which you see up there, what I can do is the following. If before I put the spring in service, I've just made the spring, I overstress it in the direction in which it's going to be stressed in service to the point that I yield it. When I yield that top surface in, in tension, it gets longer but there's a lot of elastic energy stored in that thing. I let it go, it comes back. It doesn't come back as far as it was because I've stretched the top. But coming back, it compresses that top layer and puts it in compression. So I've built in compressive stress in, this, in the piece that, that went over the yield point, right? Which is some little bit down below the surface because the bending stresses, of course, are max at the surface and zero at the center, yeah? So the, what you would do here is you make the spring with more curl than it needs. And then you bend it beyond where it yields. And if you do it right, it comes back to where it belongs to go in the truck. Okay? So now I have a pre-stressed part that fits in the truck but has built-in compressive stress along the top surface, which is the tensile loading piece in service. So again, I've lowered the threshold the, the tensile stress has to climb above before it starts to do damage. Okay? You can do this in, in the other direction as well. Take a coil spring and you take it off the, the machine that makes it and before you put it in the box to ship it, you have a machine or somebody does this by hand if possible. It's a small spring and you take it right to shut height and it's designed so that that will yield it. And then it comes back not quite as long, right? Because it's got some set in it. They call it, they call it setting the spring. So you deliberately make the spring longer than it wants to be. You compress it to uh, contact of the coils, and you calculated that that will overstress it beyond the yield point. It yields it, and it's in the direction of loading to be expected in service. That's the key. I have to overstress it in the same direction of loading as it will see in service. Compression spring has this done to it, right? So I overstress it that way. The truck spring is stressed like this, I overstress it that way. And I now have protected that against fatigue failure to some degree. All of these techniques are used in practice. I've used them in my practice. I've used shot peening a lot to uh, boost my safety factor. I often don't know how much, but I know it ain't in the wrong direction. So if I have a, a you know, I can all, all I can get is a one and a half safety factor out of this thing and I want two, Shot peanut. I probably have two now. Yeah. No, because it's still, it has changed its initial condition because it has yielded. So I don't come back all the way home. You think of a stress strain curve, you go up the elastic curve, 
you go into the yield region, you come back down parallel to the elastic curve, and you're offset a little bit at the bottom, right? So you've changed the part physically, but you still have an elastic piece to go up and down on all day, right? I want to overstress it beyond the yield point in the same direction as it's loaded in practice, in service. So for a car coil spring that you're picturing, you would collapse the coils all the way to the bottom. Having made the spring longer than it needs to be for the car, by the amount you expect it to, to shorten. So if done right, it comes back to the right length. The, the, well, the, that truck spring, that leaf spring, is loaded in bending. So the top surface of the spring is in tension, and the bottom surface is in compression, yeah. right, all the time? Yeah. Uh, unless I go, if I go too far, I yield the dickens out of it, and then it's not going to come back all the way, right? That's the broken truck. <laughs> when I have the springs down here someplace, if I've overlo overloaded them too much. But this is done in a controlled fashion. You, know, you calculate in advance how much deflection will get, get me to the yield point and how much further do I want to go, and you literally put that deflection into the spring right after you make it. Other questions on this? Oh, I do have this. I didn't... I, forgot the slide was here. So this does bad things to me. I end up with residual surface tensile stress. When I through harden, I grind and I weld. Weld is a big, uh, big uh, bad boy in this case. And if I, if I load it in opposite to the direction it will be C in service, then I do what we just talked about, go in the wrong direction. Okay. There's an example here of um, tensile stress in welds. I, I often wonder why welds work at all. If you start to look into them in any detail, you find they're a, ni they're a nightmare because you're melting the material and then it's, it hardens locally and you get all sorts of residual stresses. You look at a weld, it's full of little ripples, it's got stress concentrations up the wazoo, and uh, it's no wonder they break, and they often do. So this shows some kind of a big pump or a dryer, I guess it is. It's just a rotary dryer. And it's essentially like a clothes dryer, flipping things around. So you've got these lifters to move whatever's drying around inside. It looks like it's pretty big. I've never seen this in the flesh. So it's a big drum with ribs on the inside. And the ribs are all welded to the shell right here. There's a weld there and a weld there and a, another weld there. And this is a close-up of a crack that developed in a weld. And of course, now it, it, it starts in the weld, and then it starts to proceed into the shell. And eventually, it's, you know, the shell comes apart because the crack grows to the point where you have a fraction mechanics failure. So let's get to an example here before I run out of time. This is an example in the book, so you don't have to scribble down if you don't want to. Uh, I think it's 6-4. Very simple problem introduced by my little chart here of the four different uh, categories, I call them, of uh, fatigue design. So the top row is uniaxial stresses. That's the pure case. You know, like my tensile test specimen. I'm just doing a one-directional stress. And my bottom here is multiaxial. I got x's and y's and shears and stuff like that. And the columns are fully reversed or not fully reversed. So fully reversed is a special case. Fluctuating is I have a mean stress of not zero. Okay. And We'll take this one up first because it's the simplest. That's my fully reverse where the stresses just go plus or minus the same amount. So the mean stress is zero, unlike the fluctuating case here where they oscillate between two values and I have a mean stress sigma m as well as sigma a. So we're not looking at that one today. That'll be tomorrow. Uh, ne next day we meet. So these are repeats of what I showed you before to remind you of the fact that, first of all, there's a lot of scatter in the data. But if you put a line under the scatter, you can say that's a safe line. If I keep my stresses below that for any of these numbers of cycles, I should be safe. And luckily for us, it levels off at about 10 to the 6 cycles if it's steel. And we call that the endurance limit. So if we keep our stresses like at half that level, to safety factor 2, we should expect it never to break. Okay? This is a similar thing for aluminums. And they don't, unfortunately, go flat on us. They slope, the slope reduces, but they keep going down. 
plastics that are all over the place. They have very different kinds of materials. So here we have two cases. This is the endurance limit steel. This is the aluminum, which keeps going. Different terminology, S sub B indicates this is as low as it's going to go. That's the endurance limit. S sub F says this could go lower. It's just a, it's a point on the curve someplace. S sub F at 5 times 10 to the 8, S sub F at 10 to the 6, F sub F at 10 to the 5, all different numbers. S sub B is the same from there out, from 10 to the 6 out. So here's a simple part. We're designing a little cantilever beam. It's going to be subjected to a load that does this, plus or minus 500 pounds. So I can calculate the uh, sigma alternating, so-called, as the half the difference between the two. And in setting this problem up, the first step I do, what you'll see in the figure that this came out of, is I say, I'm going to just go to the store and buy a chunk of steel off the rack, rectangular piece, and clamp it between the two vertical pieces of my wall. And I then point out to you that even though it looks like you don't have a notch, you do, because you have a sudden change from unclamped to clamped steel. The, the stress concentration factor, the case of C for that, is 2.0 exactly. So I have twice the stress right at the clamp, where, where the part disappears into the clamp. Right at that point, I have twice the stress. So I'm trying to get rid of that, or not rid of it totally, but reduce it, by instead of buying one piece that's already sized to what I want, I'm going to buy a thicker piece. I'm going to get hot rolled this time instead of cold rolled because I don't need the good finish. And I'm going to machine it with a notch that I control the radius of. And I can get the K sub C factor down to maybe 1.2, 1.3, depending on the size of the radius, instead of 2. So I can reduce the stress concentration. Okay? So that's what I'm doing here. So 1.1 to 1.5, depending on the radius I pick. I'm sorry? Before there was no corner. Before it was just a piece of stock clamped. There was no bump on it. It was the same thickness all the way into the wall. And that's the yeah. When I clamp it, I've got the clamping force. Suddenly, it goes away. So there's an abrupt change in the force. It's almost like a jerk in a cam, right? The sudden change in force. And that, it's not really jerk, but it's analogous to the, the curves, the way they behave in kinematics. Yes, sir? I've got compressive stress inside the wall. Right. Yes. I've got a sudden change in the loading, which has a similar effect as a sudden change in geometry. And it, and it can be shown mathematically that that's exactly 2. It's not 2.1 and not 1.9. It's 2.0. So I change the design so I can control that. Instead of being stuck with 2.0, I'm going to make it be something less, like 1.2 or whatever, right? So I got 500 pounds for the amplitude. I want 10 to the 9 cycles, so I'm out infinite life. I'm going to use a, a, a low medium carbon steel, that would be called 1040. So that's got good ductility. I'm not going up into the high strength steel regime because I'm going to lose my notch sensitivity. I'm, I'm going to get more notch sensitivity, I should say. Room temperature. And I, I'm designing, so I've got to pick some dimensions. So I say, nah, I think I'll make it an inch by 3 quarter. So I can buy, that, buy a piece of stock that's an inch by um, 1 and a half. Or what, what am I making it? I'll buy 1 and a quarter inch stock, and I'll machine it down until I get the B to be the, the uh, 1 inch. Uh, the, uh, sorry, 75 is the D. The D would be 75, 1 across. Okay? Big D is 0.94. Oh, I'm, I'm buying 1 inch stock. I'm machining it down to 0.94 to clean up the surface and get the dimension correct. I'm putting a quarter inch radius in the fillet, and I'm going to have an A, which is the distance out to the force of 5 inches, and L of 6 inches. So that defines my beam. So I can set up my equations for that, which I do here. First, I find the reactions, the moment, and the, and the force at the wall, the R, and those turn out to be 2,500 pound inches of moment. And I do the MC over I based on that. And I got about 27,000 PSI. That doesn't sound too bad. A 1040 is going to have a yield strength up in the you know, <laughs> 70,000 neighborhood, probably. So for static, not too bad. But I've got to now figure out the fatigue strength of this guy. That's going to turn out to be lower. So I need to find out my stress concentration factor. So if I go to this diagram here, which is in the back of the book, out of Peterson's book, 
for a flat bar loaded in, in bending with a moment like so, I have this set of curves for the case of C factor. I'm sorry, I, I'm calling it wrong. Case of T, not case of C. Case of T, I've been calling it case of C all day. Uh, this is the ge geometric stress concentration factor. And uh, I've computerized these curves with these parameters A and B over here. So if I know the R and the D, and I know the D, big D and little d, I can pick my numbers out of here and do the computation and get a case of T. And that's what I'm doing over here. And I get 1.3. So I've got it down from 2 to 1.3. That's a good thing. So I'm now going to apply that factor in combination with my Q for this material. So I've now got to go calculate the Q for this material. So I go to those tables of Nuber factors, and I find out that the square root of A for an 80,000 PSI ultimate tensile stress, strength rather, uh, is 0 0.08. And notice I do not take the square root of that. It already is square rooted. I take my 0.25 radius. I calculate that I have a notch sensitivity of 86%, 0 0.86. So I now use that to calculate my K sub F using the K sub T of 1.29 that I got off the, the chart in the back of the book, my 0.862, which is the material property, and I get 1.25. So it knocked it down a little bit from 129 to 125. Okay? I'll take what I can get. So I got a 1 and a quarter stress concentration factor. Now I go ahead and calculate my nominal stresses, and I multiply them by the 1.25. I actually, I already did that. That's the 27,000 I did on the other page, right? So I take the 27,000 by the 1.25. I got about 33,000 PSI. I calculate my shear. I convert that to principal. I get a von Mises, which in this simple case turns out to be the same, because that's all I had. It's a simple loading. But I said this to you before, and I'll say it again. I believe very strongly, and that's why I wrote the book this way, and no other book on this market is done this way, I'll tell you right now. They'll all tell you, in this case, you do it this way. In this case, you do it that way. And it's totally confusing. My approach is I always do it the same way. I find my stresses. That's the hard part, figuring out what the hell the stresses are. Then I go to principal. Then I go to von Mises. And then I compare that to tensile strengths, whether they be endurance or static. So I'm always doing the same set of steps. So if I get the, if I get the front end right, the back end always comes out OK. So now I've got a sigma prime. Now I've got to find out what's my available strength in fatigue for this particular material. And now I've got to go, I've got to, go to the, the spice cabinet and get out all these little factors, the C surf and the, the C load and the C temp and the reliability and all this stuff, and sprinkle it into the spaghetti sauce to get the flavor right, right? We're making a recipe here. So I pick 99.9%. It's bending. That gives me 1. It's machined. That gives me 0.845. It's room temperature, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Throw them in, stir well. I get 23,000, roughly, PSI. Think about that a minute. We started with 80,000. The ultimate tensile strength of this steel is 80,000 PSI. Right away, we knocked it off by half, right? The S sub E prime, I skipped over that step is half of that. So we're down to 40 right away. Then we get out the spices, and we stir them in. And now we're down to 30, or well, less, tw no, 23. We're down to like 29%. In my observation and experience, I always end up around 25 to 30% of the ultimate tensile, depending upon which spices I use. So I'm only going to be able to use about a fourth of my available static strength in fatigue. And that's where the real danger lies. If you don't do that correctly, you're going to think you've got a safety factor, and you haven't. If you use the static strengths in a fatigue case, you're cooked. Because you're going to, you think you've got factor 2, you're probably going to factor a 0.5, or something in that order. Okay? So very important to consider these issues. I just I mentioned, I think in another class, I just did a, a consulting job over the break checking the uh, accuracy of some ca uh, calculations done on a very expensive uh, vehicle part assembly. And uh, most everything was OK, except I discovered that somebody, whoever they were, had incorrectly calculated the fatigue strength 
and they thought they had a safety factor better than two, and I came up with 1.1 before I applied the, the stress concentration factor. After the stress concentration factor, I had 0.73. And they're already making this thing. So they've got to change one part very drastically, or that thing is going to fail probably on the first time they roll that truck. It's going to break the axle because somebody screwed up on the fatigue strength. The stresses were correct. I agreed with those. Okay, let's wind this up here. So now I got to go to a safety factor. I find out I got 0.7. Not unusual. My first pass through, I pulled the numbers out of the air. I said, I think I'll have an inch by a three quarter part. No idea whether that's big enough. It ain't. Okay, easy to fix. I go back and increase the size. Right. Deflection. I had a spec on deflection. I'm over that too. So uh, it doesn't work, so I go back and recalculate, and I got it all in TK Solver. So I go in and say, gee, I think I'll make it two inches wide and one inch deep. Push the button, and out comes, what did I get? Uh, two and a half for safety factor and a 5,000 inch deflection. So I might have had to you know, hit the button a couple of times, changing those numbers till I got to a combination that gave me a safety factor I wanted. And the best thing of all is with this TK solver, this is why I love it, even though I curse it when I have to use it, because I can put in the safety factor as an input. You know, the I-O business, flip, the, flip it from the output column to the input column, and type in two and a half for the safety factor I want for N. And then I can go up to whichever dimension I want to mon monkey with, let's say the D, the little D, and I put that over to the output column and I put a guess value for D and hit F9. And bingo, it tells me I need a D of thus and such to get two and a half. And I'm done. That's worth a lot in design, to be able to run the problem backwards. Because I know the result I want. I want a safety factor of whatever. But I don't know the dimensions I need to get the safety factor. Run it backwards and let the dimensions come out. Okay. All right, I'm going to uh, stop here. This is a summary. Let me just run through that quickly. Notice I had to make assumptions that were quite arbitrary. I didn't succeed the first time. You should expect that. I have to iterate. And if you don't use an equation solver for this business, you're crazy. Because you're going to do an awful lot of extra work. And when you find that it doesn't work and you're doing it on paper and pencil, you've got to get some clean sheets of paper and go do it all over again. Right? But if I set the model up, I just go and change some numbers and run it again. So I set the model up once and then play with it. OK? And TK is the best at this particular task. OK, I'm going to quit there because I'm running behind. And I'm going to get in my truck and hope I make it home.